Hello, my name's Richard Jones, and I'm joined today by Steve Blomer. And what we're going to be discussing today are some of the misconceptions about Berner Street. So before we begin, hello, Steve, how are you? I'm OK, Richard. Very fine, thank you. Fantastic. Now, what we're going to discuss is something that caught my attention on the Jack the Ripper Facebook page, for which you are a moderator, are you not? Yes. And, uh, and it, it was a query that was raised by a poster that basically said, the only thing I cannot get my head around in the entire JTR case is how Lipsky came in and fingered Kuzminski, then the next day took back his word. I mean, he literally testified that he witnessed Kuzminski holding Listride down. Why would he do that? Now, of course, the first thing we have to say is that uh, it won't have been Lipsky that uh, would have seen Kuzminski because... The Lipsky being referred to is Israel Lipsky, who the previous year had been executed for having murdered Miriam Angel in Batty Street, the next street along from Berners Street. Uh, what's happened here is we've got a mix up between Lipsky and Israel Schwartz, who was the man walking south down Berners Street 15 minutes before the body of Elizabeth Stride was found. So I'm going to ask you, Steve, who was Israel Schwartz? Israel Schwartz was a man fairly new to the area who at the time, the day before, had been living in Berner Street. His wife was supposed to be moving that day. Um, and he was just returning home, the intention of seeing if she had moved. And if she had, he was going to walk further on down into Backchurch Lane where she'd moved to. And so he's walking down Berner Street. It's about 12.45. And ahead of him is a broad-shouldered man. And as he watches, or ahead of him, he sees this man go to the gateway, which was Duckfield Yard, where Elizabeth Stride's body would be found 15 minutes later, and there's an attack. Yeah, the, one of the problems is, Richard, that we've only got, we've got two separate accounts of this. One of them is a newspaper report from the Star, and the other one is the police report. Well, we haven't actually got the police report. What we've got is Swanson's summary of the police report. And there are some significant differences between them. For instance, in the police report, it says that um, Schwartz turns south from Commercial Street. Then he sees a, a, he sees a, a woman at the gates, and then he sees a man in front of him who's talking to her. Whereas the star says he turns again south from Commercial Street, and he sees a man walking ahead of him walking in that direction the man appears to be intoxicated and when he gets to the gates then he stops and sees the woman so that's the first difference the second difference is that in the police report it says that the man in front of him who let's call him broad shouldered man because that's what he's known as he uh grabs hold of the woman and turns her around it says and, tr and pulls her onto the pavement and throws her down Whereas the press report says that he grabs hold of her and pushes her back into the passageway. And then the third difference we have is a bit later on where as Schwartz is crossing the road, he sees a man who've been, who is now referred to as Pipe Man. And in the police report, the man's lighting a pipe. And in the press report, the man is holding a knife. So we've got three significant differences for a start. Now, do you think this could be because uh, Israel Schwartz couldn't couldn't speak uh, couldn't speak English? He was uh, ev every report we have is done through a translator, is it not? Yes, as you say, I think the, I think we've got two issues at work here. I think one we've got translation problems like push and pull, and I think the other one is that the star was known for sensationalising, and it's far better to say there's a second man with a knife then um, saying it's a man lighting his pipe. It sounds better from a newspaper selling story, basically. But that doesn't mean we should disregard everything in the star. And it doesn't mean we should accept everything which is in the summary from Swanson. Um, Schwartz says that as he approaches uh, the spot where the attack is taking place, he starts to cross the road. And at that stage, a cry is made out to him. Well, cry is made, a shout. Now, in the police account, it appears to appears to be that it's broad-shouldered man who's shouting out. And the impression which Swanson gives 
is that the man is shouting to Pipe Man. Whereas in the press report, it's Pipe Man who's doing the shouting and they shout out the word Lipsky, which has become uh, synonymous with a slur on Jewish people. So we've got yet another difference there. And we'll come on to that in a second. Because where we now lead from there is that on the 1st of November, Inspector Aberline, who had conducted the interview of Schwartz, wrote an internal memorandum. And in that memorandum, he said that um, Schwartz could not be sure who the shout was aimed at. But it appears to be pretty clear from what Aberline is saying that the shout comes from broad shouldered man, not from pipe man. So, so, and, and this is basically where, where the Lipsky comes into it. It's that shout that's made by, by someone. Yeah. So there's some debate as to who, who actually said it. Uh, but we think it was a yeah, broad shouldered man who, who shouted it across. Yes, it appears to be the general feeling is broad shouldered man shouted it out. And Aberline's view was that although um, Schwartz was not sure who it was aimed at, Abilene's view is it was aimed at Schwartz, not at broad shouldered man. Now, what happens after that, of course, is that broad shouldered man, uh, Schwartz gets concerned and hurries off, scared. And then he says, it says in the report, that he's chased all the way to the railway arch. Now, a lot of people interpret that as meaning he runs all the way down Burner Street. The only problem is there's no railway arch at the bottom of Burner Street. So what looks, either he takes a detour at the bottom of Burner Street and goes left um, and then goes on down, or he turns right into Fairclough at the bottom of, bottom of where, just where Pipe Man was, turns right there and then guns down, goes down back Church Lane. Now he says, the, the reports say that he's chased. But then we go back to Abilene's internal memorandum and Abilene says that Schwartz actually isn't sure if he's chased at all. All he knows is that the second man was also moving away quickly and running away, but he doesn't know if the man was chasing him or was just disturbed and concerned himself and trying to get out of the situation. So again, we see there's more changes, more differences. The problem is we only have these two reports and they're not spot on. They disagree with each other. And they also, to a great extent, disagree with the internal memorandum given by Abilene a month later. Uh, this, of course, is one of the big problems with the Jet Therapy case. So, so many reports, so many newspaper articles contradict one another. Mm. All the time. The, the other thing that was, was in that original post was that, um, that he fingered Kosminski. Now, this seems to be referring to the fact that Kosminski... Uh, was identified at the seaside holiday home later on. But of course, we don't know that he did finger Kosminski, and he certainly didn't finger Kosminski the next day. No, this is um, a situation of someone putting two and two together and getting five. I mean, those of us who suspect that the, the, the murderer was Anderson's suspect, i.e., someone who was called Kosminski, believe that it's, it's a good possibility that Schwartz was the person who saw him, but we don't know it's Kosminski he saw. This is just going too far. He saw someone attacking Stride, and it's possible that he then later identified this person at the seaside home. But we can't be sure it's him. It could be the vendor, or it could be someone we just don't know as the witness. Um, the poster was jumping the gun, basically, and putting two and two together and getting five. Can I interrupt there and just say that Le the lavender in question was the man who saw Catherine Eddowes talking with the man outside Mitre Square? Yes, indeed. Um, and of course, the thing is that he's not he, did, he doesn't finger him one day and then repudiate it the next. We've got no idea of when he identifies um, this. If he, if he is the witness, we've got no idea of when he actually identifies the um, suspect. All we know is that once he's identified him, he finds out that he is also a Jewish person and refuses to testify. And that's that's it. So what we're getting here is wishful thinking, I would say. And of course, we don't know that the police witness was Israel Schwartz. No, well, there's a good chance it, it was. I mean, I did a good I did an interesting talk on this a couple of years ago on Casebook. And he's a good 
he, he's a good bet for being the witness, but he's not the only one. And, you know, I may go for him today. Uh, somebody else may go for the vendor. And we may even have a third or a fourth uh, possible witness. I mean, Joseph Hyam Levy is a very good witness if you're looking at uh, Jacob Levy as the, as the suspect. So we can't be certain about anything. This was just jumping the gun. Yeah. And, of course, another thing that people um, have raised to do with this post is the fact that um, Kosminski doesn't go into the asylum till 1891. So, therefore, what's he doing? Why, why does he suddenly stop murdering after Mary Kelly's murder on the 9th of November, 1888? Do you think he does stop murdering? Because we have to remember there are 11 Whitechapel murders and there were further murders in Whitechapel after Mary Kelly's murder. I do not believe the killer, I do not believe the killer actually stops. Um, we have several more on the list, don't we, as you, as you mentioned. We have the Rose Milet case, but I tend to disregard her. We have Alice McKenzie, who I personally think is a very good candidate for a Ripper victim. Although the wounds are very superficial, they are also very similar in design to the minor wounds on Mary Ann Nichols. The, the minor scratch wounds are very similar and the intent is the same. The intent is the same, I have no doubt at, at, at all, just not done so well. So we may have a gap from November 88 until the, until the middle of 89. We've then got a very long gap and um, some stage around, the thing is we don't know when this um, identification takes place. What we're told is that after the suspect has been identified and knows he's been identified, there are no further murders. So um, I believe he may have been identified in the middle of 1890, which is, which is assuming that Kosminski is the suspect, when Kosminski apparently spends three days at the workhouse and then is released back to his family. It just seems a little bit um, coincidental, shall we say, because it fits in with what Swanson says, that he is released back to the care of his brother. And indeed, Aaron Kosminski is released back to the care of his brother, Wolf, at that stage. So, uh, I mean, Alice McKenzie, uh, there are similarities as well, Alice McKenzie and Elizabeth Stride, and that it's, it, it's the throat's being cut in both cases. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the main similarities, I think, the throat's been cut, but what I see there is that we have a killer who is attempting to repeat the um, abdominal wounds. This is why some people say that, oh, it's, it's a copycat, because they're, 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 they're mere uh, shadows of the former. I'm not so concerned with the major cuts. It's the smaller cuts on the side, scratch-like marks, which are very similar to the marks we see in... Mary Ann Nichols. Now, it's possible that for some reason the killer, having been in inactive for seven, six, seven, eight months, is very unsure of himself. This would be very true if the killer is not a professional who is used to cutting things up. Um, it's just unsure of making the stairs very hesitant. We must also remember that if we take the police evidence for the Mackenzie case, then it's very high probability or while the killer is killing her there are two policemen talking further up the road and surely surely the killer can hear these two so he's he's possibly flustered he's rushed for time and he just commits something which is a a pal imitation of previous ones or it is a copycat you take your choice and of course, the other thing is there are those who think that Elizabeth Stride wasn't a victim of the killer we now know as Jack the Ripper. Oh, yes. I have many days debating this with people. Um, there are people who want to assign it to um, a, domest a domestic, but there's no actual evidence as far as I can see for that. It's just people wanting to assign it as a domestic. There are people who do not want to accept that Stride is a Ripper victim for various reasons. Some of these being the, it's just the fact that the throat is, is cut. A lot of people also find it hard to equate the behaviour of broad-shouldered man, if broad-shouldered man is her killer, 
with what they see as the behaviour of Jack the Ripper. Because this is a man who obviously is not concerned about what's going on around him at all. He just attacks and the Blitz attack. There's no planning involved from what, from what we can see from Schwartz's account. And for a lot of people, that just doesn't fit well with their view of Jack the Ripper, who they view as someone who's very cunning and very planning and very cultured and um, talks to, to the victims and gets um, gets in well with them, gets persuades them that he's safe. To the extent we see some researchers um, accepting that Stride is a Ripper victim, but then postulating that, in fact, Broadshoulder Man is not her, her killer, that he's somebody just having an argument with her, throws her to the ground, goes off, and then the killer comes along afterwards and, and kills her. Again, because they can't, I think, it's, I may be wrong, but I think it's because they, they find it hard to equate the behaviour which is described by Schwartz with how they picture Jack the Ripper. So we've, we, so we've got this, uh, as I said, this thing, Elizabeth Stride might not be a Jack the Ripper victim. Uh, you think she was a Jack the Ripper victim. And personally, I, I do as well. I think, he, I think he was interrupted by Louis Diemschutz when he came into the yard. But of course, the other thing about Alice McKenzie is that Dr. Thomas Bond, uh, the, the um, Scotland Yard uh, divisional police surgeon, he was asked in 1888 to look at well the form the form murders up to that point Mary Nichols Annie Chapman Elizabeth Stride Catherine Eddowes, and whilst he's looking at the reports of their post mortems the killer murders Mary Kelly. So when he puts his report in, he's done a post-mortem on Mary Kelly, and he says that they these five were murdered by the same hand. So that gives us the idea of the canonical five. What a lot of people don't um, um, either know or choose to ignore is that when Alice McKenzie was murdered, Bond actually does go on record to say that he thinks that murder was carried out by the same person who carried out the previous five murders the autumn before. Well, the thing to also note is that as opposed to what happens after the, the, the Milet case and some of the others, after Mackenzie, there's a big increase in police numbers again on the street. So somewhere along the line, someone was concerned that the killer was back out there again. And the police numbers are increased for a few months. And then when nine chaos happens, they drop off again. But I, will, I would like to uh, just mention here, you say you believe that Dimschutz um, disturbed the killer. I don't. I believe that the killer was disturbed just, you know, as he was committing the crime in that Schwartz saw him. At that stage, he just cuts the throat to silence the victim and walks away. That's a, that's a different take on it. And, uh, you know, either can, is perfectly acceptable, I think. Yeah. And do, do you think he was linked to the uh, so-called pipe man uh, uh, who was across the road? Do you think there was a connection between the two? Like, no, I think pipe that? man is a, another bystander. I think it's another bystander. And I think we get this from later on, in, after the stars published their initial story, they then have a follow-up, which says that following um, Schwartz going to the police, a man has been arrested and they're still investigating him. And then it adds that, that, that we um, the police do not wholly believe the man's story. Now, a lot of people interpret that to mean that the police at Lemon Street do not believe Schwartz's story. But if you read it through, it's talking about Schwartz, and then it goes on to this man who's arrested. And then it says the police do not wholly believe this man's account. So I suggest the man, the person they don't believe is the person they've arrested. And that person is either pipe man or broad shouldered man. So it's a question of which one of the two. But I think pipe man is completely innocent. He's just not a bystander who panics. There is a school of thought which says that pipe man um, is an accomplice of broad shouldered man. And there's a further thought of school which says that broad shouldered man is just the attacker initial attacker who for, for some reason maybe he's in the club and she's in the way and just throws stride to the floor he goes off and then pipe man comes back and it's pipe man who's the murderer there are some people who suggest that pipe man is kosminski um it's a merry-go-round richard unfortunately you know you get on and get off where you like on that one uh, but my own view is that pipe man is completely innocent and that when the 
Star reports that the police don't wholly believe the man. They're talking about the man they've arrested, who is one of the two men who is mentioned by Schwartz. And, of course, one of the things about Schwartz is that, uh, obviously, he, he's seen an attack on a victim 15 minutes before that victim's body is discovered. And yet, as far as we know, he wasn't called as a witness at the inquest. Yes, very complicated. Um it gets even more complicated when one looks at um, a report sent first by Anderson and then from, which was sent upwards. Warren then sends on a further report to the Home Office, which actually states that he gave evidence at the inquest. Now, clearly there's no record of, of that. And the fact that he's not even mentioned in the summing up would suggest that it's not even given in camera as such about the press there. I think, though, it's not beyond the, world, the realms of possibility that Baxter actually spoke directly to Schwartz himself with a translator there and looked at the evidence he gave. And then the police possibly said, we'd rather you didn't call this, this man for whatever reason, because we think he's seen the, the attacker. It's up to you as coroner, obviously, to decide whether or not you think his evidence would add to the jury making their, reaching their conclusion. And I don't think he actually does add anything because he doesn't add a name. He, the time is roughly the same time and the cause of death is the same. So he doesn't actually add anything by him appearing. But there are many people who argue that he's, you know, him not appearing means that nobody believes him. Well, it's pretty clear that on the 1st of November, Abilene still believes him. A couple of days on the 6th of November, when Anderson sends off his... He, he, Anderson and Warren are sending off um, re reports higher up. They still believe him. So there's no reason for Baxter not to believe him unless ba ba Baxter's actually spoken to him. But this goes on and on and on. And if you go on any of the forums, you will see it being debated most weeks with people for and people against him being called. And do you think he was, uh, or when do you think he came forward? Uh, because obviously he, he he did come forward. When do you think they they located him, or did he come to them? I think he came forward very quickly afterwards. Um, having heard about it, I think he came forward possibly because he thought he may have may have been seen in the area um, by a pipe man, perhaps even, and wanted to come forward and clear himself and say this. So he he came forward obviously very quickly. Um, Perhaps when he got home, he told his wife about it and sort of, no, I've just seen this person being attacked and somebody chased me, or I think somebody might have chased me. Um, so I think he comes forward very, very quickly. He obviously finds somebody, you know, he goes to the police, a translator's arranged for him, basic, basically. And then we get, he then star contact him straight afterwards. Um Within a couple of days, Richard. That's when I mean he's given both interviews. I'm pretty sure within a, within a couple of days of the attack taking place. Yeah. So he's come forward and he said, and obviously he didn't think, or as far as we know, he didn't finger Kuzminski. He just fingered a suspect that he'd seen. He might possibly have been the witness who was called in uh, to uh, to identify Kuzminski at, at the at the seaside home. But what's interesting there is 1891 is when the identification supposedly takes place uh, at the seaside home. And a lot of people then say, well, uh, uh, Kuzminski was uh, Kuzminski can't possibly have been Jack the Ripper because he was a harmless lunatic. He picked bread up out of the gutter. He wasn't the sort of person the women would go with and feel secure with. But you've got a problem with that as well, haven't you? Yes, well, where do, we, where do we start? Let's start with the first bit about um, he's not the sort of person woman would go with. If we if we take the Schwartz description on its own, no one's going with him. It's, it's a blitz attack, and it could well be they were all blitz attacks. We've got no way of knowing. We assume that um, Eddowes is not because she's, she's apparently seen with a man at the entrance to the square, but we don't know for 100% that was Eddowes and her attacker at all. It could be it was Ed Ocean, she went into the square and somebody else attacked her. So that's one thing. The second point, of course, is that 
the descriptions of Kosminski being completely harmless, um, imbecile, um, mad person are all from 1891. Um, we can't, I argue, extrapolate back to 1888. All we've got are his admission papers. His admission papers have two dates on there. There's the initial date of when an answer to a question, date of first attack, and it's six months. This is then, some say corrected, I would say clarified, in red ink to six years. Um, depending on which illness he's suffering from, that is not um, contradictory. Some forms of schizophrenia, you might have your first attack six years before, then you have periods of, I won't say full remission, but you have better periods um, as you progress. So it could be that, in fact, when they gave the six, six months, they've talked about when this last attack started, which surprisingly enough, if you backdate it, is to just after uh, the three days at the, at the workhouse, in the middle of 1890. Six years would be when he may have had the first attack. We also have a situation here. Let's play devil's advocate now and say that Kosminski is not Jack the Ripper. Well, then his family tried to have him committed in the summer of 1890, and they failed. They try again in February 1890. Um, the informant in the first case is his brother, Wolf. The informant in the second case is Jacob Cohen. Jacob Cohen is probably a work colleague of Wolf's. He's also possibly the brother of Wolf's wife. And if he is the brother of Wolf's wife, then he is also first cousin to Aaron. <laughs> Uh, but it's him who gives the, gives the information about eating out of the gutter and having not worked for several years. And it may well be that having failed to have him committed in 1890, they exaggerate his condition poss possibly just to make sure they, that they get him out of the way. Because we do know that the family, he's staying with one of his sisters at the time. We do know that they're about to have a child. So it may well be that this is all done just to make sure he's locked away. That's playing the devil, devil's advocate, saying that he's not Jack the Ripper. If he is Jack the Ripper, then he's identified some six months beforehand, prob probably. And um, the family, I would suggest, if that's the case, have come to an arrangement and decide to have him locked away because they can't look, they can't control him anymore. And of course, the, the Kosminski of eighteen ninety one might not necessarily be the Kosminski of eighteen eighty eight. Uh, we do. I mean, we, for example, we do have a court case of him in 1889, don't we? When he's, he's accused of having an unmuzzled gun. We do. I was just about to mention that. Yeah, he appears at the court case. Yeah, I shall. Um, in December 1889, he appears in court for walking an unmuzzled dog, which he is stopped by a police officer in Cheapside. I believe. I believe it is. Um, We've got several reports of this in the press, but they're all minors. There's, there's two major reports. There's one in Lloyd's Weekly. Now, the one in Lloyd's Weekly is written in the third person, and it gives the impression that a brother, doesn't say which brother, but we assume Wolf, because Wolf was one he's been closest to, speaks on his behalf. And he speaks on his behalf, apparently, because Aaron is not capable of talking. That's the impression it gives, and that's the impression people who are anti-Kosminski make. We then have the City Press report. The City Press report is part of the Batum, and it makes it pretty clear that Aaron Kosminski is talking for himself. So why is his brother there? His brother's there, apparently, because of a problem over his name and address. It's, you know, if his name was Kosminski, they went by the name Abrahams. Uh, and when I, I think I believe that the brother is just there to clarify that, in fact, is the same person that he, he actually is. Um, Abrahams and Kosminski, the same person. 
And when asked about it himself, Aaron says, I go is by Abrahams because Kosminski is hard to spell. That doesn't sound like somebody who is not capable of communicating or having to have someone else talk for them. When he's fined, he also um, makes the case to the bench that he can't pay today because it's the Jewish it's the Jewish Sabbath. So he's given till the day after to actually make the payment. Again, this is not the impression people who argue against Aaron and saying he's 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 too unfit to do anything like to make. But it's obvious that he appears in court in December eighty nine, and he's, he he doesn't appear to be mad in court or unable of defending himself. If he was, if he was that bad, surely the bench would have had him committed there and then if he was a danger. Uh, this might seem a silly question, but do we know whose dog it was? <laughs> yes, it, apparently he says it's Jacob's dog. Now, we don't know if that's Jacob as in first name or Jacob's as in second name. But looking at what we know later, that Wolf had a short-term um, partnership with Jacob, with somebody called Jacob Cohen, that Jacob Cohen was actually their first cousin and was actually the wife, sorry, was actually the, the brother of Wolf's wife. It may well be that he's walking one of Jacob Cohen's dogs, but we don't know for sure because Jacob does appear to have been based mainly in Manchester, but it's also possible he was, it, obviously he came down to London as well. We just don't know where he was at that period. Well, the impression I get from that court case, he comes across, he strikes me when you read it, he comes across as a bit cocky. He's got a bit of, uh, I wouldn't say contempt for authority, but he's a bit of a cheeky chappy in court. He's making <laughs> making these statements. Yeah, so he comes across as a, a, he comes across as a cheeky chappy. He's not the figure that some like to portray him as, as someone who just sits there and can't talk for himself. That's obviously not, not what the city press report rep, reports. And this is the problem when you have only one or two press reports and one's in the third person and probably written by somebody who wasn't actually there and one's part of the baton, which probably was written by somebody who's who's there. And then if, if you report the Lloyd's Weekly report, you get a completely different impression of what went on to as if you, re if you report both of them. So if we go back to the 30th of September, uh, if we finish with where we started, and, and so broad-shouldered man is walking ahead of Israel Schwartz, and Israel Schwartz sees him, uh, he most certainly attacks a woman in, a gate, in the gateway, Duckfield Yard, where Elizabeth Stride's body is found, and Schwartz definitely identifies the woman as Elizabeth Stride. Yes, he's taken to the mortuary and he identifies her at the mortuary. So he met. So he probably did see uh, the early stages of Elizabeth Stride's murder, and we've got the presence of the other man across the road, who's ever after known as Pipe Man because he's lighting his pipe uh, or uh, in the uh, doorway of the pub, and uh, Pipe Man then appears to. Well, according to one report from Schwartz or one translation, he appears to chase after him. Uh, and so Schwartz, Schwartz runs off. So do you think that Schwartz did see the early stages of Elizabeth Stride's murder? I think Schwartz very possibly actually saw the whole of Elizabeth Stride's murder. So I don't think it lasted much longer than a few seconds. I think he saw the man who killed her attacking her. Um, and if he didn't actually see the death cut being made, it was made within a few seconds of him turning and leaving. And as for Pipe Man then, do you think if Pipe Man wasn't connected, wasn't an accomplice, so do you think that uh, he could have been the witness as well? Could he have been the witness who identified? Pipe Man could have been, but his, his positioning makes it more difficult. Um, again, you see, there's a misunderstanding here. We're told he comes out of the of the doorway of the beer house. They says public house, but it was actually actually a beer house. The beer house is just down from the gate. Where the opposite side of the road comes from is from um, the press report, I believe it is, where Schwartz talks about the shout cut the shout from the other man who's on the opposite side of the road is the opposite side of the road to where Schwartz is now. It's when Schwartz has crossed over. So he's on the same side as the attack. That's, that's how I read it. Other people may read it differently. 
Yeah. But I just don't think that pipe man's in a position where he can actually get a proper sight of what's going on. He, he, he see a scuffle. Uh, the lighting is in favour of... The lighting is bad, full stop, but it's in favour of Schwartz where Schwartz is crossing rather than pipe man who's 20 or 30 yards away. Uh, whereas Schwartz is probably three foot away. Yeah. Do you think pipe man actually saw the attack as in noticed the attack? Or do you think that uh, he just saw uh, Schwartz hurrying across the road or hurrying out of the way? I think he would have seen the attack. I would have think he might not have seen, he wouldn't see as much detail as Schwartz saw. He would have seen some sort of altica altercation. He probably heard the shout being thrown out. And of course there is debate as well over what was actually said. I mean, the general view is it was Lipsky, but it doesn't have to have been. It could have been something which sounds like Lipsky. Some people over the years have, su have suggested the shout was actually Zizzy, as in Liz Stride. Um, I myself have postulated that it's actually the Polish word for mind your own business, stop being nosy, which is Rzipski. I've probably pronounced that terribly. But again, they've all got sounds that could be so now, it's, one must be fair here, it says that the majority view and the view of Schwartz himself was that the word used was Lipsky. So unless we've got real reasons to um, go against that, we should keep with that, really. Well, I think it's just one of the many sort of grey areas, confusing areas. And of course, um, there are so many misconceptions in the whole case, but you've got all these little misconceptions uh, in Berner Street. And I think that uh, that so many of them centre around a was she a victim and b what was Schwartz reliable in what he saw. So do you think we can hand on heart say that Schwartz was a reliable witness? Yes, I put my hand on my heart and say he's a reliable witness. But the thing is, we have to just be very clear about what he actually saw and what he saw. And I shall just summarise it here. He was walking down Berner Street. He saw a man walking ahead of him. As this man got to, towards the gates of Duckfield Yard, there was a woman there, there was an altercation. Um, Schwartz got concerned, started to cross over the road. At that point, there's a cry is, is made of Lipsky. Schwartz then gets really concerned and starts to leave the site as soon as possible. And he's then, as he's leaving the site, he's aware that Pipe Man, who he's got to go past, is also leaving the site quickly as well. I think that's basically it. Those are the actual facts. Everything else is supposition and invention. Well, Steve, it's been fascinating talking to you again. And uh, no doubt we could, we'll be discussing more and more about this case uh, in, the, in the months and even years ahead. So thanks for joining me, Steve. That's my pleasure.